Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome along to our prayer meeting and Bible study this evening. You're all very welcome, and it's good to see you here tonight. We want to welcome uh, our preacher for tonight, Mr. Stephen Greer, a fourth-year student in the Whitfield College of the Bible, and want to thank him for coming along at quite short notice. The Reverend McKee had planned to be here. Um, unfortunately, he's on well. He is making progress, but uh, he's unable to be here uh, tonight. So I thank our brother for coming. Um, we'll just hand over now to him and ask him to take the rest of the meeting tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the welcome. I'm definitely close enough to the mic. Thank you very much uh, to our brother, Mr. McLean, for the welcome. And yes, we are hoping Mr. McKee will recover quickly. He's been dealing with a bit of an illness for some time now. And so I'm happy to be able to help him. And I'm glad of the opportunity to come and bring God's word to you again this evening. We're going to begin worshiping the Lord tonight with hymn 259. 259, the whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Once we get the introduction, please let's stand and praise the Lord. God's help for this meeting, and so let me encourage you just to uh, quieten ourselves and quieten our hearts and seek God's face now in prayer, please. Our Father in heaven, Almighty God, we come before Thee this evening, and we confess that the light of the world is Jesus. And Lord, we confess that because we believe it to be the truth of the Scriptures, for it is what He Himself said. 
I am the light of the world. Father in heaven, we thank you that in him, in his blessed person, and in his work, we see the light of the gospel. We see that wonderful message that has shone and still shines to those who are in darkness and bids them come to the one who can give them the light of life. We thank you, O Lord, that in many of our hearts this wonderful light has shined. We thank you, Father, that in our lives you give us the grace to shine and to, uh, to shed that light abroad so that others can see it as well. We look forward, Lord, to the prospects that are described in that final verse, where in heaven, in, the, the, in Emmanuel's land, there is no need of the sun or of the moon, for the Lamb is the light thereof. And we confess, Lord, that we cannot imagine what that will be like, but Lord, we believe it. We believe that in Him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We believe, Lord, that he is the express image of God. We pray, Lord, that you would increase our faith tonight, and even as we bow our heads now, that you would give the help of the Holy Spirit in this time of worship. We thank you for each one who has come this evening. Lord, a, a change in the regular schedule of the church, but we pray that you would bless each one who has gathered, and perhaps those who watch online as well. We pray, Lord, that you would speak through the scriptures this evening, and through the hymns of praise as well, that we would be taught, and that our hearts would be encouraged, that Christ would be the focus of our thoughts for the entirety of this time. Lord, we have much to come and ask you for tonight. We have much to praise you for, and we ask, Father, that you would give help to thy people tonight as we come in due course to a time of prayer. Lord, we remember Reverend McKee tonight, as he had planned to be here this evening to uh, to, to undertake studies with the congregation over a number of weeks. We pray that you would, your hand would be upon him, that he would quickly regain his health, and that you would bless him, Lord, in all of his labors, including that in this congregation. And we pray that you would give him help, give him wisdom. We pray, Lord, for everyone here who continues to labor on and faithfully serve the Lord in this place. We pray that you would help them and that they would be uh, vessels of uh, channels of, of blessing to this area and that souls would be saved. We thank you, Lord, for reports from the recent mission of God working, and we give you all the glory for this, Lord. We pray, Lord, that this would continue and that even those who have been saved would themselves become bright and shining lights for the, for the Savior and that they would bring others to Christ through their own witness. We ask that you continue with us now, O Lord. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Could we sing again, please, hymn number 411, I want, dear Lord, a heart that's true and clean. We'll keep our seats on this occasion as we sing 411 together, please.
God's word this evening, we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And so I'll ask you to turn there, please. And we will read some verses from the beginning of the chapter. Second Corinthians 4, beginning please at verse 1 and down to the end of verse 7. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Amen. May God bless his word to our hearts. Please just bow with me for a moment before we come to his word. Our Father in heaven, we come now to consider the scriptures that are God-breathed and are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And Lord, it is instruction that we need. It is sound doctrine to which we must hold. And Lord, it may be, and likely is, that in our hearts there's something that needs to be reproved. And Lord, we pray that you would do such a work in our hearts through the Scriptures, as you take them and apply them by the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, We ask sincerely for his help and for his power. Lord, we want to be in possession of the experience of the power of God. We want to know his power this evening, helping us to worship as we should. And so we ask tonight, Lord, that you would bless preacher and hearer, and that all things would be done to thy glory. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to take time to think about and look at God's creation. It's good to appreciate the wonder and the beauty of what God has made. Not long ago, one night after coming home from a meeting, while I walked from my car to the door, I looked up at the sky and noticed that it was a very clear night and I could see lots of stars and I was able to pick out a few of the well-known constellations. And then I was surprised and really quite pleased to have noticed what I thought was a shooting star, and then I spotted another, and then a third, and then it quickly dawned on me that this was very unlikely, and these, not were, these were not shooting stars, but they were actually satellites, and I felt very silly, and I went inside. But there are people who can distinguish between satellites and shooting stars, and those people will tell us that from any point on the Earth's surface where there's good visibility, a person can see with the naked eye approximately 3,000 stars. And then, of course, on the opposite side of the globe, a person from that perspective could see a different 3,000 stars. But, of course, then with the use of the invention of telescopes, millions more stars come into view. And it's estimated that the galaxy in which we live, which is called the Milky Way, contains 200 million stars. Of course, this is an estimate. And there are many more stars than that in many other galaxies. And no one knows the exact number. And you know, the Bible has been telling people that for thousands of years. Jeremiah 33 verse 22 says, The host of heaven cannot be numbered. There was a time when people thought that that was incorrect. And as they looked into the sky with merely their eyes and no telescopes, which had not yet been invented, they would have counted and counted and arrived perhaps at a number approximating 6,000. And they would have thought, well, that's it. We've seen them all. And then, of course, science caught up with the Bible, and God's word was once again proven to be true. 
And the first time we read about that host of heaven that cannot be numbered is in Genesis chapter 1. And I'd like, as we introduce this text this evening, to look with you at Genesis chapter 1 and the first couple of verses in that chapter. Those 200 million stars in the Milky Way and all the billions of stars in all the other galaxies are mentioned in a very cursory way in Genesis 1 and verse 16. Because there we read, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Those countless stars are simply an afterthought in this verse. And perhaps that's because in this verse God is, God is recording the creation of lights that were particularly for the well-being and the life of mankind and everything else on this planet where we live. And to us, the stars contribute relatively little light. The sun and the moon are the main sources of light, but they were not the first source of of light that ever shone on this planet. You will find the first light that this world ever, ever saw in Genesis 1 and verse 3, where we read, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. This is the first light, not the sun or the moon or the stars, that ever shone on this earth, and God's creative command of this light, bringing it into existence, where the first recorded words, the first direct speech, in the entirety of the Bible that God spoke over this world. And this event is so significant that it is this event that the Holy Spirit chose, as he inspired Paul to write in 2 Corinthians 4, to describe the miracle of God's grace in the salvation of a sinner. This first ever light that God spoke into existence is used as an illustration of how God saves a soul. You see, that's what Paul is dealing with. If we go back to 2 Corinthians 4, in verse 4, he talks about the glorious gospel, in fact, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. In this passage, Paul is speaking about his ministry. Look with me, please, at verse 2. He says here that he preaches the gospel faithfully. He says, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. There's integrity and honesty about Paul's ministry. And then in verse 5, Paul emphasizes the fact that he preaches this gospel alone. It says in verse 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And then in verse 6, Paul explains why he faithfully preaches the gospel alone. Here is the reason. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. And I want to look more closely at this text with you tonight, which teaches us about the light of glory. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6 teaches us about the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, and to go a little further, how that glorious light is experienced by people like us. First of all, notice with me from 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6 that this light is imparted. This light is imparted. Like every other part of creation, the light there in Genesis 1 and verse 3 came into existence by God's spoken command. Previously, the earth is described as being without form and void. And there was darkness upon the face of the deep. And we don't exactly know the form of the light that came into being in Genesis 1 and verse 3 when God spoke. But we're given some idea through the word that Paul uses here that's translated shined in verse 6. That word means a brilliant or a radiant beam. A brilliant beam of light at God's command shone out over a world that was in darkness and without form and void. And so you can imagine that, can't you? Pitch blackness and a brilliant shaft of light. Light, you see, was imparted to this earth by the command of God. And the Holy Spirit uses that image to teach us about how spiritual light is imparted to the souls of sinners. And if you're saved tonight, how it happened with you. You can see, first of all, that just as there was darkness on earth, so there is darkness in the souls and the hearts of men and women. The light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, that gospel light, it was not discovered by men and women. Go back to the days of your conversion. You did not come up 
with the gospel message. You did not invent it. It was imparted to you through the preaching of the word of God. And it was imparted to your soul as it existed in total darkness, just like the formless earth back in the days of creation. The darkness of men's hearts is a well a well-proven fact in Scripture. One verse I could mention is John 3, verse 19, where the Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Just as the darkness of earth was absolute, so the darkness in men's souls before God saves them is absolute and total. And then we see from this picture of that light in Genesis 1 and verse 3 that just as the visible light was the first thing that was imparted to the darkened and formless earth, so the light of the glory of God is the first thing that is imparted to the soul in salvation. The believer is a person who's described in Ephesians 1 and verse 18, where it says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. We received light. We received the light of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And then we see in this image that that light at creation, when God said, let there be light, and it shone. No heavenly body, no planet being involved. The light simply was, and it was created by a supernatural power, and it's the same in salvation. God shines into our hearts, and it's a supernatural thing. Jonah put it simply, salvation is of the Lord. That light that illuminates our hearts and by which our eyes of our understanding are enlightened, it is supernatural. It is the work of God. Salvation's plan was conceived and will be completed by God's supernatural power. And then finally, we see from this picture that just as darkness is the absence of light, so this light that came into being in Genesis 1 and verse 3, and in the heart of every converted sinner, was an entirely new thing. God has done a work of creation in every saved sinner. We are new creations. We are new creatures in Jesus Christ. It is a new thing that he does. And we see all this from that picture and that image in Genesis 1 and verse 3 of the light that shone out of darkness. We walk in newness of life. And Paul preaches the gospel because this light has been imparted to him. And you and I go about our lives every day, we trust as the Lord gives us help and gives us opportunities, and we shine to others the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it has been imparted to us by his grace. The light was imparted. You can see then in this text, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, that this light informs. If you look closely at the verse, you'll see that light is actually a metaphor for knowledge. It says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. We can say truthfully that it was knowledge that had illuminated the mind and the heart of the apostle and of every other sinner who has ever been saved. It's by knowledge, it's by words, that the light of glory is imparted to the sinner and received by the sinner as they have faith in the message conveyed in those words and in the person conveyed in those words. The gospel of Jesus Christ shines out of the words of Scripture, and Paul delivered this glorious message by words, by preaching. I was thinking earlier about the Philippian jailer. And even if we assume he had never come into contact with Christians before those two men were put under his charge, and he had never heard the gospel message, as he was exposed to them and heard them late at night, perhaps he had heard them singing, which is what they were doing. And then there was the earthquake and he was extremely terrified in fact, he thought he was going to lose his life because the prisoners had escaped. Well, no, they hadn't escaped. We were all, they were all there. He came to Paul and to Silas, and he asked them, what must I do to be saved? He knew that they were in possession of gospel light, and that's why he came to them. But he needed to be told. He needed the words. He needed the wonderful words of life. 
And that light could not properly shine into his heart. He could not be saved without the message of the gospel. What must I do? Tell me, please tell me how I can be saved. This light informs the sinner. And you wonder why preachers talk about the original text. Because those are the inspired words of the Holy Spirit. By which this message shines forth. The word knowledge in our text is the Greek word gnosis. It's first used in the New Testament in Luke 1 and verse 77, which is a reference to the first preacher recorded in the New Testament, John the Baptist. And in Luke 1 and verse 77, his father Zechariah describes the message that John would preach. And he describes his purpose as to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by remission of their sins. Every New Testament preacher since John the Baptist has been seeking to shed and to shine forth the same light, to give knowledge, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Why? Because lost sinners need to be informed. And it is true, Christian, that your unsaved work colleagues and friends and family can see simply by observing your actions and your 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 walk, if we take it literally, the physical way that you conduct yourself, and the things that you do not do and do not say, they can see in those things your godly example, your testimony. But if those people are to come to Christ, at some point, and sooner rather than later, they need to hear the words. They need to hear the message. They need to be informed about this glorious gospel light. Romans 10, 13 and 14, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You can see in that and in our text, the believer's responsibility to inform others. There's a sense of responsibility here to give light. And we saw earlier that this is Paul's explanation for why he preaches the gospel. Why does he preach the gospel? 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, for God or because God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in my heart. That's why I preach. That's why I preach the gospel faithfully and the gospel alone. Paul knew that he had received light, light that had been imparted to him. And he was to take that light and with it illuminate audiences everywhere he went. Jesus Christ told his disciples in Matthew 5, 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. We have the privilege and the duty of reflecting the light of Jesus Christ, of letting it shine out of us to inform others about the glorious gospel because knowledge is essential to salvation. The knowledge of the gospel is essential to salvation. Saving faith is not blind faith, regardless of what atheists may say. It is not blind faith. It is faith in the Word of God and in the person of Jesus Christ. And therefore, for the Christian, the ongoing work of salvation, sanctification, looking towards our glorification, that ongoing work is a process of continually being informed by the Word of God. In in the book of Philippians, Paul reminds the Christian of the importance of using our minds to study the Word of God, which is the basis of our faith. He says there, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I trust a timely exhortation to remind us all that we cannot continually be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ if we are not reading the Bible. This light This gospel is what informs us not only how to be saved, but how to be more like Christ. Romans 12, Paul writes, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And again, there's the importance of using the mind and of taking in the word of God, which informs us. It doesn't just inform the sinner. It informs the Christian. On the other hand, And to provide balance, I want to point out that a true sight of glory and a true knowledge of Jesus Christ is much more than just knowing facts. Only the Holy Spirit can give faith. It is possible to know the Bible and not be saved. 
There are people who have passed theological exams and been called to churches as ministers, and they are not themselves converted. They do not have this light in their hearts. Many have known the Bible and have never known God. They've never seen the light of his glory. And sadly, that is so because while they have a knowledge of facts, they do not have the knowledge of a person. They are in possession of information, but they are not in possession of Christ. You see, the, the knowledge that Paul speaks of, this saving knowledge, is the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a personal knowledge. And it comes truly only when a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and trusts in him and receives him by faith alone. Then they see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so if there is anyone in this meeting or listening to this message who is unsaved, you are commanded to repent and to believe the gospel and you will never possess this light, the glorious light, unless you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, it is of him that we are informed through this glorious message. Let me point out a concluding thought as we find in this text that the light of glory is imparted to the soul and that it informs the soul. But specifically, thinking of Jesus Christ, we see that this light is incarnate. This light is incarnate. It says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And it's the normal word for his countenance, his visage, his face. Could you turn with me please to the Gospel of John and chapter 1. A few moments we spoke of John the Baptist. And his calling, as Zechariah described, was to give the knowledge of salvation. John 1 and verse 7 tells us the same came for a witness. To bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. And you can see in John 1 and verse 7, the word light is capitalized. It's given to the Lord Jesus as a title. It's one of the names of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the light of the world. Here is light, his title. And therefore, I say to you that in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, the light is incarnate. It was light in flesh. Look at John 1 verse 15. It tells us, Sorry, verse 14. It tells us, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And one of the wonderful thoughts and one of the wonderful facts about the person of Jesus Christ is that in him, sinful men and women could do what otherwise was impossible. In him, it was possible to behold his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. You see, throughout Scripture, it is shown time and again that sinful people have no capacity to behold the glory of God. It is not possible. The glory of God, and God is presented in Scripture in the metaphor, in the image of a consuming light. Think of Exodus chapter 33, where Moses requested of God, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And God's response included the words, there shall no man see me and live. And when Christ came, when he was born here in the main, laid in the manger in Bethlehem, the shepherds in the field suddenly were surrounded by the shining glory of the Lord. And their response was, they were sore afraid. They were terrified by the glory of that attended that scene. Sinful man has no capacity to behold the glory of God, but in the person of Jesus Christ, we behold his glory, and we may. We may gaze on the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. A humanly speaking, normal face. A face that then later was marred more than any man's. Christ told Philip in John 14 and verse 9, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Think of the face of our Savior. William Bridge said that God is best known in Christ. And then he speaks of the body in the sky. And he says, The Son is not seen but by the light of the Son. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. 
Jesus Christ reveals God to us. And in his earthly ministry, in his humanity, the deity was veiled. But once at his transfiguration, three of his disciples were allowed a glimpse past the veil. And they saw that his face did shine as the sun. They saw a little believer of what we will see in heaven. And when the risen Christ appeared to Saul on Damascus Road, he was blinded. Saul was blinded by a light that was more intense than the sun and revealed the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to that man. And he was instantly converted. And now he writes, perhaps with some recollection of his conversion experience, which takes his mind back to Genesis 1 and verse 3 that he had known since he was a child and memorized and recited. And now he had seen that light for himself. And he realized that God was known in the person of Jesus Christ, whom he had been persecuting. And now the light of the glorious gospel had shone into Paul's heart. And many of us have had it to shine into ours. In Revelation 22 and verse 4, we see the future for the saint described, one of the glorious realities of heaven, and they shall see his face. The face of one who at a time was despised and rejected, a face in which men saw no beauty that they should desire him, a face upon which they spat, a face which was twisted with agony on the cross, a face that was covered with his own precious blood. This is the face of the Son of God, incarnate light. And as we sung earlier, Revelation 21 tells us, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall see the fullness of his glory in his radiant face, and we shall be like him. What a day that will be. As we look to that glorious prospect, our responsibility is to do what Paul was engaged in and to tell others. Other people who are in darkness and are on their way to hell, they need the gospel. They need not only the example of the Christian, they need the words of life. And it is our privilege to carry that message to them. And I trust that this message will have been an encouragement to your hearts this evening, and will have led you out to the time of prayer. May God bless his word. Before we come to prayer, we will sing uh, hymn 628. So let's uh, stand to sing hymn 628. After the introduction, I am praying, blessed Savior, to be more and more like thee. And think particularly of verse 2, considering the message that we have had Let's stand, please, after the introduction.
before the Lord now. And I would just encourage you to enter into the time of prayer and to come in as soon as you are able, as soon as the Lord has put it on your heart and to have a good time of prayer this evening as we seek his face for the congregation here and for his work.